Since I was a young kid, I've loved the book of Revelation. Not that I've always understood the book of Revelation, but I've always loved it. Let me tell you how it was when I was a kid in church. Mom didn't provide me a bunch of entertainment in the pew during services. I really don't remember having a bunch of books or magazines to read or to look at as the preacher droned on and on. Um, and certainly no toys. Now, if I had a toy with me, I, I had snuck it in. And if I was caught, there would be repercussions. I might have had my little sister to torture a little bit uh, in, in the pew. Oh, hi, Beth. But um, not a lot of entertainment. Didn't have any kind of electronic devices. Mom and Dad never got me a cell phone. And uh, the church did not have Wi-Fi at, at the place we worshipped. So what did I do? Well, some, sometimes I slept. That's true. I, uh, I was allowed to do that until I got to a certain age. But many times I read. And the book that was there to read was the Bible. Imagine reading the Bible in church. And the book in the Bible that I often turned to in those early years was the last one. The book of Revelation. Why? Well, it was cool. There were monsters in it, and wars, and angels, and plagues, and all kinds of stuff that might attract the attention of a distractible young man like me, who, who loves scary movies and adventures. So many times I would read Revelation while the preacher preached. I guess there were worse things I could have been doing. And if um, the preacher happened to be preaching on Revelation, which was exceedingly rare, I must say, I would listen to the preacher. Well, as I grew up and learned more, I was glad to see that I was a blessed child. Why do I say that? Well, let's read a bit from Revelation together this morning, okay? Let's just begin at the beginning, uh, the beginning of the end of the Bible, you might say. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. You see, I was a blessed child. A blessing is pronounced there in verse 3 on the one who reads this prophecy. That is, this book, Revelation. And so if you have read along with me this morning, just these three verses, you are blessed. And indeed, if you have heard them read, you are blessed. And if you follow through and live according to the words of this prophecy, you are blessed as well. whole lot of blessing going on there in verse 3 of chapter 1 of the last book of God's word, the book of Revelation. Let's talk about a couple of things this morning to sort of set the stage. We need to talk about Revelation we need to talk about blessing, and then we need to talk a bit about where we're heading with all this in future lessons. 
First, revelation. Notice that it is revelation, not revelations. It is singular, not plural. It's interesting that in this book that we call Revelation, the very first word of the book in the original text is revelation. In, in the Greek language, it is the word apocalypsis. You may be familiar with the term apocalyptic, which in biblical studies uh, refers to a certain kind of writing, a certain kind of literature in the Bible. We find it in many of the Old Testament prophets, so in places like Isaiah and, and Daniel and Ezekiel, we find this apocalyptic, and, and indeed we find it here in this New Testament book called Revelation. And it's writing that is full of signs and symbols and sometimes fantastic images that are designed to draw attention and to make an impression, and of course, to deliver a message. Here, the very first word of the book is revelation. Again, apocalypsis in the original. But interestingly, this is the only place that the word occurs in the entire book. So the word revelation occurs in the book of Revelation just one time, right here, the very first word of the entire book, here in the, the first chapter. Every place else in the book where the book sort of refers to itself, the word is prophecy. It's called a prophecy. Um, that word occurs many times throughout the book, including right here in verse 3. Did you notice that? Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. So what is revelation, apocalypsis? Have you ever been to an event where they were unveiling either a, a new painting or a sculpture or something like that? Um, sometimes I know like automakers will have a, a dramatic unveiling of their latest, greatest new car. And I think Apple um, every year does some kind of big ceremony when they reveal their new iPhone. Well, he here are some pictures, I hope, on the screen of a ceremony just a few years ago at the U.S. Military Academy where they unveiled a brand new sculpture that was in honor of uh, the great Civil War general and U.S. President Ulysses Grant. And this is usually the way they do it at these things. The, the work of art is un is uh, covered up, it's veiled in some way, and then there's a fancy ceremony where important words are spoken, and at some point the cover is lifted and the new work is revealed for all to see. That's really an excellent way to understand the meaning of this word that begins this book, this apocalypsis, which we translate revelation. It is a revealing and unveiling. So this book is a revealing or unveiling of Jesus Christ, verse 1. And all believers, all those who wear the name of Jesus, ought automatically to be interested in this book and what it has to say because it has something revelatory to say about our Savior, about King Jesus, the Messiah. Now, Jesus revealed this particular message to an angel. Notice that in the words we read, verse 1. This angel in turn revealed it to John the Apostle, who then wrote it down so we could hear it eventually. Um, he wrote it down after he saw it. That's in verse 2. So the order is this. The message comes from God through Jesus to an angel, then to John, who's at the time on the island of Patmos in the first century AD, and now to you and me. Pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, that, that's what revelation is at its start. Now to blessing. 
What we find in Revelation are seven specific blessings pronounced throughout the course of this prophecy. The first one is right here, chapter 1, verse 3. The next one is in chapter, four, ver, uh, chapter 14, verse 13. 14, 13, if you want to look at that, and um, that's what we'll look at next time we have opportunity to study together on this you want to read it in advance but what's what's a blessing uh, we're going to talk more specifically about that as we move through these seven blessings of the apocalypse so i think it's really important and we've probably not studied it near enough and we probably have a pretty stunted view of what a blessing really is uh, we might think of a blessing as a good thing, a good thing that happens to us. So we see a beautiful sunrise or sunset, and we might say, what a blessing. And that's true. But what a biblical blessing is, is so much richer than just a single pretty moment. So we'll study more about blessing and what it is and, and how to bless one another, which is something that um, we don't do enough, probably because we don't know how. You know, Jesus blessed people all the time, right? As you read uh, the Gospels and the stories about him, he blessed children, he blessed the sick, he blessed his disciples. He even blessed his enemies. You remember? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. A blessing he pronounced on his enemies while they were killing him. The Lord's great sermon in Matthew chapter 5 begins with a bunch of blessings, right? So blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. You're familiar with that passage. There, there are, you know, we, we often call those beatitudes, which is just sort of a, a, a fancy way of saying blessing. Well, there are seven of these uh, beatitudes or blessings in the book of Revelation. The first one, again, right here in verse 3, chapter 1. And again, this is what it says. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. For few minutes that we have left, I want you to consider this wonderful blessing from the apocalypse. There is a divine blessing in reading the word of God. Now, this, this applies particularly, of course, to this specific book, the book of Revelation. But the principle most certainly applies to all the Word of God. There is a blessing in reading the Word of God. We need to, I, I think, keep in mind the setting that was original to these first hearers of this. It's a setting that's almost totally different than what we know. You know, in those days, the days that John was uh, alive and, and writing down these words of revelation from the Lord, most people did not read. And that wasn't their choice. It was because they could not read. Now, a lot of people who can read today choose not to read. But people at that time didn't read because they couldn't. Different kind of setting. Also, it was very uncommon at that time to have your own copy of any book. Um, and for an individual church, 
uh, like one of the seven churches that's mentioned in chapters 2 and 3 that follows this, it was very uncommon for them to have a copy of a Bible. Um, they, none of them would have had a complete New Testament at the time, all 27 books that, that we have before us. And you know they would have at least been missing book number 27, the book of Revelation, and likely many of the others. When you went to church in the first century, it was different. It took time to complete the writing and the compiling of the New Testament, and it took even longer for it to be common to have a copy of it uh, of your own or even for a church to have a copy of their own and it still took even longer for most people to be able to read it for themselves. We take each one of those things completely for granted today, don't we? Everybody pretty much can read in our city unless one's just too young. We all have easy access to many books, and we all have probably countless copies of our own of the Bible, the full Bible, whether it's in print or on an electronic device. So for them, when they came to church to hear the word of God, they literally came to church to hear the word of God. Think about that. They had no books on tape or CD or live stream. They assembled as a church and the word of God would be read publicly so they could hear it. Imagine that different kind of setting. So they would have never argued the idea that there's a, a wonderful blessing in hearing the word of God. They so rarely got to hear it. When we assemble, we read the word of God still. Although we can all read it for ourselves and, and we have multiple copies of it that we can easily access. You know, part of our public worship assembly is devoted to the public reading of the word of God. It is a holy moment when the word is opened and read. It is a blessed moment. I've often thought that sometimes we ought to stand in reverence to the word of God when it's read. Why not? It is as holy as singing and praying and, and everything else we do. Now as a congregation here, we are currently reading through Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. I hope you have noticed that we do that when we assemble. Each, each week we read a portion. I'm not currently preaching on those verses that we're reading, uh, but that does not matter, you see. I have always felt the reading of the word of God is an act of worship and devotion that stands on its own. It is a holy, blessed moment. It is not a setup for the sermon. It is the reading and hearing of God's word. You know, Paul told Timothy, uh, the younger preacher that he was mentoring, he told him in 1 Timothy 4, verse 13, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. And, and so we do. And may we always do so. 
And to those young men who stand before us and read each week, we appreciate so much your leading us in that act of worship. You are blessed for doing so. You're blessed. Caleb and Hunter and Wilson and Sam and Caden and Griffin and Hyatt and others. I'm probably in trouble now for missing somebody. But blessed are you for reading the word. Blessed are you. But you see, there's more than just reading the word, isn't there? There is hearing it. And all the rest of us who assemble are involved in that. One may read, but all may hear. And blessed are you that hear. To hear the word of God is a blessed privilege. But those of us who hear, we need to keep something very important in mind. And that is that in the Bible, hearing is much more than just a physical process that's facilitated by functioning ears. In the Bible, hearing implies keeping. True hearing includes obeying. So if, if one hears God's words but does not obey God's words, then one has not truly heard. To hear God's word is a privilege. To obey God's word is a duty. It was the Lord himself who spoke this blessing. He said, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Luke chapter 11, verse 28. And also recall that James, the brother of the Lord, wrote these words. He, he wrote, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. James chapter 1, verse 22. So blessed are those who read the word. And, and blessed are those who hear the word. And blessed are are those who obey the word. The first blessing of the apocalypse. Now this morning, as we conclude, we offer an opportunity to obey the word. We haven't spoken about the acts of obedience, uh, salvation obedience at least, in detail this morning, but perhaps you've been reading and hearing, and now is the time for you to make a decision to follow your Lord, to be baptized into to Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, as the word says. We offer you an opportunity, a convenient time now, and, and, and now is the time. Or maybe you need to come and, and relying on the power of prayer, which we read about in the word, ask for the church's prayers about something or for help. If there's some way we can serve you this morning, we want to do so before we um, end our assembly. And so let us know. All together we stand and sing this song.